Cool. Anything else on that before we go on no. the writing speaking? No. That's about it. Okay. So remember I mentioned this, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, pinpoint a way to say it exactly, but I, I, I wrote it down as the people government dichotomy and yeah. how come, um, this is how I'm phrasing it now, the people government dichotomy and why you can have like, when you see, when you see um, any country that um, is aggressing or doing something bad, like take Iran, for example, or take, I don't know, uh, Hamas firing rockets into Israel or Israel um, defending itself against Hamas. Um, and then people say, oh, it's not, you know, the, the people in the street, they want to just, you know, they just want to sell paper and, and cultivate uh, dates on their farm and, and live. They don't care about any of They would all live in peace. Um, and then I'm, I, I don't know about Nazi Germany, but may, maybe it's similar in that you get, um, oh, you know, it was all because of, it wasn't the people. It was just Hitler took over and did all these bad things. And it seems to be that, um, like, I, I don't doubt that a lot of people desire to just live and uh, live well. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't, it would be hard for me to imagine that everyone just wants to destroy each other. But then that right. doesn't seem to be enough is what, because why is it that you always get these, you know, like even Russia, right? Take, take the, um, oh, there's so many examples actually. So there's, there's Russia in uh, World War I uh, during the, the revolution. And then there's yeah. Mao Zedong's takeover of China. And then, you know, the, the 40 million people dying from famine because he tried to collectivize uh, agriculture or like yeah. he did a cultural surge and he killed like 10 million people to try yes. like get rid of bad habits. And so, but you could say, oh, you know, the people, they just want to live and they just, that it's all Mao Zedong or it's all, um, it's all uh, the Bolsh, you know, it's all the Bolsheviks or it's all just the Hamas or it's all, but where, what is, there's got to be some responsibility like that we each have because how does how does this always happen that you have these governments it can't just be that there's some evil force that comes in and just takes over everything against everyone's will yeah i think it reminds me of what we talked about once like whether you should be politically active or not right it's a lot to do with your context and to what extent the government's actions actually impacts the life you live or the world you live in. I mean, yes, you're right that there is not a fine line between the supporters of the government and the people who want to just live. To some extent, you bear responsibility because it's where you live. You're around the people. You presumably would have some say in the government to some extent. So of course, we'd also have to ask what form of government even exists there. Was it a dictatorship where you literally couldn't do anything? Or even then, you could start a revolution if you really wanted to. There's nothing that completely absolves you in a way. You could resist, you could run away, you could think about what you could do to respond if you're values are threatened. Part of it has to do with to what extent are you responsible? To what extent can you influence what's occurring? Yeah. I mean, there's only so much a peasant can do against Mao Zedong. And some resisted and they died. And, and the, question, the question could be, do you flee with to Taiwan? Do you with Shen Kai-shek? Do you stand up Mao Zedong and get shot? Do you do what he says because you don't want to die and you want your farm? It's hard to say. Always oh, is a matter I think of um, deeply questioning to what extent you can stand by and watch. It gets very it's, complicated, of course. Yeah. Uh, what in, so there's a lot of things so that inspired this. So obviously partially watching the news and then hearing a reporter yes. say that, that specifically in this conflict between Hamas and Israel. 
that say the reporter said that you know I met people on the ground they just want to they all just want to live in peace and but it's so bizarre and then so there's that and then I, I remember speaking to a friend and I'm similar to him but he doesn't care about politics he doesn't know who the prime minister is he's like I don't care about any of that stuff I just want to live my own life and I do wonder like it made me think about like yeah or maybe that's the attitude you know like the government just takes over more and more and then some people are just, I just want to live my life. I don't care. I'll just comply with this thing. And so I can just eat and, you know, do things. And then that just keeps on extending itself. Like there's no limit to what, how much they yes. take. And then they right. just, and then, but I, I don't know. I can't quite figure it. Cause that this would have like thinking about this would have implications for it, how much action you should take. Cause I don't know how much responsibility I have, like put me in, put me in any other country, um, you know, put me in China post World War Two. Put me in uh, Russia during World War One. I'm not going to put a dent in the Bolshevik Revolution. I'm not going to put a dent in Mao Zedong's takeover. I'm not going to. So you know, just because I, I'm in Australia and I happen to live in a country that has some, at least implicit recognition of rights. That that's uh, it's not related to me. So I would be. Uh, driftwood as well if I was in some country where well I, actually I don't know that I, I wouldn't want to take part of it but it's like what it's the question of what is my responsibility exactly I don't know like you point out it's complicated it's especially difficult because there's so many variables that I can't find a good principle to go with here other than right. analyze the situation it is partly why like stories about revolutions fiction and nonfiction, because it gets into really complex questions. Like to what extent do you join the revolution? To what extent do you pass it off as idealistic people trying to do whatever they want to do? It also gets you to question, if you were in this situation, what would you do to respond? Would you let yeah. it go? Especially in like being, it was black in the South in the sixties. Do you just put up with it or do you do your best to fight back? Right? So, or do you just go north and avoid the problem entirely? It's a difficult question. There's a quote I'm, I'm thinking of and uh, I, I'm just wondering which book it's from. Let's see if I can remember it. Ah. Uh, it's a, it's something about, um, have you read George Orwell? Yes. Oh, you have? Okay. There's a quote. I don't see, yeah. And 1984? Yeah, both of them. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading 1984, but there's a quote that I, it wasn't, it was related to George Orwell, but it wasn't George Orwell. It's something like, uh, man is like a cow able to, he just bears everything and, and all pains and struggles and just keeps on standing in the rain. Something like that. I, I yeah. it was said way more eloquently, but uh, that's what it makes me think of what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, so we don't we don't really have an answer or a way to frame this well, right? Like, what is our role? And and uh, I think what, you could just there's many questions you'd have to answer for that. Okay. Like, I think like even Atlas Drugged itself could be about that topic. The entirety of the book, like. When do you join in this? Yeah, I guess shrug? it is. Yes. Do you shrug or do you just, or do you insist on doing what you've been doing? Do you join yeah. cults? Do you do your own thing like Dagny? What do you do? Especially when you have the options. Dagny could go back, do her stuff, yeah. put up with things, or just throw it all away and start anew. Yeah. What and why do you think um I remember, I think Rand said something like this, the extreme always wins. Or I, I don't remember exactly what the, do you remember, do you know what I'm talking about? Not really. Okay. So I guess I'll just ask the question without saying this, because it'll probably just be confusing about the extreme. I can't remember the exact, the exact quote, but um, why is it that, so in these countries, it's never like the moderates that win. If you look at any, say, Middle Eastern, dictatorship and the Iranian revolution, right, was a move towards uh, a more radical uh, religious government. And 
in um, uh, same in Iraq or Afghanistan or any any country or like Hamas's takeover of the Gaza Strip as opposed to um, you know in the West Bank they have the um, a, a more moderate government it's more like a dictatorship because the guy has keep it he keeps extending his term but he's they think that if if it was it's just a matter of time before Hamas would take over the West Bank as well and they're more extreme and so there's probably more examples you can come up with but why is it that you always have like why does the extreme always win uh, they always take over and so then you, you 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 do get radical governments that do something crazy can't like most people that. most people aren't radical and extreme right but yeah um, but so why is it that the yeah that that's that question of the radicals why are they always winning I don't have a good answer to that. I'm not really sure. Do you, do you know what I'm referring to though? Yes, I do. Okay. I know what you're do, saying. Do you think that part of it, this is only a partial thought because it was more like a lead. Part of it is that if you're more radical, you're more motivated and you're going to fight to the death over something where someone else will go, oh, I don't care about it that much. I'm not going to fight to the death over it. And so it doesn't matter if you're one person against 10 if you're willing to kill yourself in order to set, put some law in place, like you're not going to be opposed. Right. And yeah, so the power, the power of your values. Right. And so um, that maybe that's what I was thinking determines, you know, cause I can see, I was just, I, I have this picture of my friend who said, yeah, I don't care about it. I just want to live my life. And like, what, what if you have someone who like wants to put in place all these laws and they're willing to fight to the death over each law someone like my friend or me in many cases would just say, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't care. It's not, I don't, it doesn't, you know, it's not about me. I just want to live my life. I don't, I don't care about any of that. So you're less likely to have a person who's going to fight tooth and nail to the death over one, every little inch of something yeah. because for a radical it's, this is still very abstract. So I don't have enough concretes to go by, but that was a lead that I thought maybe, well, I would think if you're passionate about your values, you pursue them to the greatest degree you can. And any opportunity you have, you would take. There's no resistance to you. Or if there's less resistance, you can take more opportunities. That's more just very general. It could be the form of government can just hold it back anyway. I'm trying to think what. What, sorry, what do you mean by that? The form of government holds what back? Well, like U.S. checks and balances kind of naturally prevents that, even if some people are lazy and don't care. I mean, just naturally the checks and balances right. prevent any radical takeover quickly. Right. So it could be the form of government that prevents it, but what is radical behavior for somebody? And I would say it's simply that the more you feel for your values, the more you pursue them, the, the greater extent you will go, the more motivated you will be to attain them, as opposed to somebody who has minimal motivation to resist or push back. So if you have one person not doing much or opposing, and another person taking as much as they can, I think there's gonna be a power imbalance. But do you, do you think, uh, cause you know, when I think of like, so I'm thinking of my friend, right. Who said that, like, I don't, I just want to live my life or whatever. Like he just wants to, I don't know, make some money and travel and, and I don't know, do, do fun things with his life. Like you could have him and he, in a sense, values his life more than a radical, let's say the True. radical values destruction. And, True. and so I'm thinking, is it, is it then, which is it, is it, as you've indicated and as I thought originally, like motivation for values, or is it the fact that one has a more integrated world world view and every little thing is something you'll fight tooth and nail to the death over. Um, and the other one is like, it's less clear what all these connections are between different things. Like, you know, for example, um, if they censor some professor you know, someone might just say, well, that's not, I don't care about that stuff. That's not me. That that's irrelevant. Like, and they keep censoring more and more things and you're like, well, that's not me. I don't care. And, um, there's stories about this 
as it relates to Jews in Nazi Germany as well, like as they keep rounding up more and people and you're like, oh, that's not me. It's irrelevant. Like it's the inability to see the connections between different things. I don't know if it's that or if it's the motivation by, because how can you be, anyway, I don't know. Is that, that's a question. It's probably too. an interaction between the two. On the one hand, there's people might not be integrated and see when it's time to push back. And there are those in the face of a, also those who, pursue this end to any extent, to any way they can, to any possible end. The combination of the two is not going to mix. The unintegrated person isn't going to even push back. I mean, you got to have some sort of resistance to actions to counteract the, the system they're creating. I mean, if they're building a oppressive system, yeah. you just have to stop it somehow otherwise it will just continue just by i would call it inertia just inertia of the radical just doing what they do yeah. without resistance it just continues right and it's natural human behavior to just continue with the way things are like once you start on a path you just continue it because you've gotten used to it now. It's where you're going. You just continue. And if everybody's just continuing their same behavior as well, it's only gonna increase or the, yet things only just keep getting worse. You're making the case for bad principles drive out the good, which is one thing I was thinking about yes. before with like that's what Leonard yes. Pickoff was saying in his electron principles yes. hmm, okay uh yeah I had more I don't I had more questions about this but I've uh, I've lost them now it's okay maybe if I remember we can come back yeah okay let, let's go to the next I'm just curious what you think about this so framing like comparing design problems versus engineering problems. You might not know, but I was reading a book on design design methods applied to say, thinking about life, yeah. like values and mm -hmm. uh, work. And they said that engineering problems involve a precise fixed goal, which you reach with lots of an analysis of data and design thinking is, this is a bit of a mess because I just randomly wrote stuff down. Design thinking yeah. is less about a single precise solution but let's say many alternative designs uh, and it's not necessarily backed by a lot of hard data analysis and you're not optimizing for like a very specific thing. Is that, do you think that, uh, and, and then, sorry, it says design problems are solved by a kind of iterative prototyping and trial and error and designers, this is probably just nice phrases that don't mean much, but designers think, don't think their way forward. They build their way forward. Do you think this is a bit too vague? distinction yes. okay cool. i think it's just mostly in terms of what kind of people are engineers what kind of people are designers but i think any good designer could be should be a good engineer and vice versa right. the whole form follows function thing and that's the sort of principled way of looking at things this is more like almost like a personality style like designers do tend to be that way more test things out Engineers do tend to be precise, fixed goals. And, but I think that's a personality thing, not the nature of the field. So you don't think that the kinds of problems that you, I don't have enough knowledge of these fields, either of these fields related to, to say so. That, um, but I was curious because uh, there's a lot of analogies between design and like, you know, planning value hierarchy and that kind of thing. But um, so you, you don't think it's in the nature of the problem themselves. You think this is actually more what they've described in this book, which I've sort of copied here loosely is, is, is actually personality differences as opposed to yeah, what I said, uh, nature of the problem in design and engineering. I would guess so. Okay. And when I'm thinking about like an architect, if you're an architect, you better know some engineering ways of solving problems. I mean, in the one sense, you don't, sure you're not doing physics problems to necessarily determine the, say the force that can go on a bridge or something, but yeah. you need to understand 
that way of analyzing is being precise, knowing your data, knowing what the form can withstand. Um, you need to be able to think like, do engineering ways of thinking. As in, yeah. I say that I just mean to say very precise and specific ways of thinking. I shouldn't say thinking like an engineer, but a designer needs to both design and engineer. You have to engineer the form of the way it interacts with the world. But then the design is also the aesthetic, the appearance of it. But I mean, there's a Isn't that integration the of the two. Isn't that the yeah. form? Yeah. The appearance. It's just integration of the appearance with the nature of how it works. Like the form follows the function. You got the form of it, the appearance and the function is more like the engineering aspect. Although, you know, that, that, that saying form follows function. I met an engineer who said that often what happens is, uh, maybe I've got to ask him more questions, but he said something like the designers first design something and not give it to him to try see if it's possible to make or not. So it's almost like the opposite function follows form. If you know what I'm saying, like in that process that he was telling me about where it seems like the company just comes up with an idea and the designers create something um, and then he'll just see if it's possible. And then they'll, they'll go back, you know, they'll have to redo it because it might not be possible. And then he'll tr see again and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't know, because I don't have full details of the process, but that sounds like the opposite of form for well, I would say form is function. Maybe is a better way to put it in okay. my mind form that is they're, function. they're shared things Yeah. that to be effective form is to be effective function that you can't divorce the two. And that's what I mean. There's okay. not a true, a true separation. Yeah. Okay. There are aesthetic parts, there are engineering parts, but I wouldn't say there are engineering problems or design problems other than just in a broad sense, like, are you building a bridge or are you designing some clothes? I mean, one's obviously just a design problem because it's design field, but that isn't to say there are no engineering questions when designing clothing. Right. Right. Okay. But you, you do seem to have this distinction in mind of engineering questions, design questions. Yes. So, okay. The questions. Yes. I would distinguish it that way. All right. Cause that's, I think that's what they were getting at then. They were like, how do you, this is a book about, work and career, which is what I'm reading. Yeah. And it did. Yeah. It, it gave a lot of examples of like, well, it described, you know, so design thinking, but let, let's go with design questions as uh, rather yeah. than developing a solution. For example, let's say in my situation, if I'm applying what they call design thinking, it would be, it wouldn't be finding some optimal work or solution to my problem. It would be prototyping many different alternatives that appeal and then trial and error for each of them, or, you know, not, not spending all this, time, <clears throat> excuse me, not spending all this time introspecting, but as it's written here, build your way forward by prototyping lots of different kinds of work and then trying for a certain period of time. Um, but that you would say those are more design, like, so that's, yeah, anyway, so there's, there's less of a distinction between them, but you do think that there is some kind of maybe method or questioning process that each might have. Yeah, just as far as like, it makes me think of deductive versus inductive, like engineering here. It's like you got specific definitions and you're deducing certain things from it, which is valid and good to do. Right. So that's what say geometry is. Most of math is that way. You got some axioms or rules and you deduce things from there, which is valid. And the uh, design is more describing inductive process where you're trying to discover or figure out what you need to do that you don't know the answer. You're not deducing things, you're assembling what you observe to create something new. But 
that's usually what I think of it like. Isn't it, you know, I actually was thinking of, remember we went over hypothetic, hypothetical deductive. Yes. And isn't this, isn't designer yes. a bit, you list your, like there's part of that that is an uh, inductive, but you're still, you're taking, let's say your, your values and your interests and your personality and whatever else and you're inductively coming up with hypotheses, which you then deductively test. You're like, all right, here's one prototype. Here's another, here's another, let's test them all. Isn't that hypothetical deductive? It could be, but I would just advocate doing it differently than that. I wouldn't just test them out. I was more like a matter of looking at what options there are and seeing what happens not specifically deducing what the truth from it is, but using it as information to figure more out. That's more what I mean. Uh, sorry, explain that again. So it's not, it's, it's not hypothetical deductive. I reserve that just for strictly testing and then looking at if your hypothesis is confirmed. I think it's much too narrow for okay. that kind of area. Okay, got it. It needs to be more open. Okay. That's all. There was something else in this book called reframe, which I've heard of before. It's like challenging a bias yes. to open up as I, I like the way they've written it. It's very geeky. I like it. Solution spaces, opening up new solution spaces. Um, and it helps you deal with dysfunctional beliefs. So you make sure you're working on the right problem. It actually made me think of when you were telling me about Aristotle's principles and asking the right questions. Yes. And I so, agree with this one. Do you I think like this one? Do you think it's it's an it's actually I've seen this language a lot, and I do wonder if that's what they're, they're basically all getting at the same thing, which is your principles, your philosophy affects the questions you ask. Like yes. Um, and so to reframe is actually difficult without someone else's help, unless you're challenging uh, if we oh, want to go with what are they called? First principles, unless you're challenging yes. first principles, yet yeah. you almost can't reframe. You've got to like, you know, part of the process of me uh, learning was asking you lots of dumb questions, right? Yeah. All over the place. And then you'd yeah. point out like, okay, it's not that essential to this article. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then, you know, but I wouldn't have, if I was by myself, I don't think because I had whatever my pre-existing philosophy and principles were that were implicit, that was what I was going to do. I don't see how you can get out of it. Um, it can be tricky. I think it, one way is directly questioning something you've said to yourself. If one person might say, oh, I don't, I avoid people because I'm anxious and unsure of if they'll like me, but it could be that you ask yourself, is that true? Like if that's what you were thinking, right. you might say, is it actually because I think I'm better than all of them, that they're too stupid for me. Therefore, I don't go out and nothing to do with anxiety. And that could be a way to reframe a question that can gets you ask new questions and maybe realize it's false and realize it's a better explanation. Could go either way. That's one example of reframing just directly questioning your conclusion, even if it seems obvious. Often, though, in that situation you gave, uh, well, actually, so, I mean, this is a different, this is a bit different, but in the example you gave where, like, someone's thinking about going somewhere and they're like, oh, they're anxious or what, I can't exactly remember, but let's say they're anxious, like, oh, I won't get along with people. But to directly question the conclusion, you, you, you can't because you don't have the information. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I won't get along with people. You don't know until you go. So, yeah. You'd that have way, to yes. go even more. You'd have to challenge something even more primary than that. Like, does it matter if I don't get along with people in this specific case? What I meant more, which should be more specific. I was thinking in the context of, say, somebody's doing therapy or yeah. they're trying to figure out their own motivations. And in a way, you're right also, though. As long as you need a professional or somebody else who knows better to get you to ask the questions that's what therapists do they, they usually reframe things that's practically their job reframe your thinking 
So you come to new conclusions, which is itself a skill. You're right, it takes a lot of, so you always need help to do that. But either way, that's, I think, key to changing your own behavior and changing your own thinking. To reframe. It's reframing. Yeah. And in the process of reframing, are you, do you would you agree that you're, what you're doing is implicitly uh, stimulating or questioning some more primary belief? So, for example, um, if I ask myself, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. What, what am I doing with my life? Something like that, okay, which I've sometimes asked. <laughs> and so a reframe on that would be, are you going in a direction that you like? And so there's some kind of implicit premise in asking the first question that the second one is challenging, which is something like, I should know exactly what I'm working towards in every respect and angle. I should know, for example, if I'm going to be rock climbing in Bratislava or living in New York or eating sushi in uh, Tokyo. But in reality, maybe the, the more appropriate mindset is I should know what my values are in the abstract and I should know if I'm heading in that direction we could take which could take many different forms I don't know I'm, I'm kind of making this up but because I, I don't know exactly what the underlying premise is but that that's what I'm getting at like so is the reframe that was the example so is the reframe in that case uh challenging your underlying premise because but someone else is giving it to you but it's it's implicitly challenge challenging the underlying premise that made you ask the first question we could probably come up with more examples right um yeah yeah i mean that's one way it occurs there's also the more basic way just like creativity puzzle. like one time right. i did like a there's a word puzzle i like to do sometimes i reframe it by literally flipping it upside down. And sometimes I find new answers. I mean, that's the sort of basic reframing that's okay. not as big picture, but then- That's on a more literal level, like you're actually yes. reframing it. Yes. Or then we can go more abstract, like your conceptual space or solution space to say, however, your concepts are organizing your head. If you pick a new concept, you can activate different related concepts than normal. So if you start asking about, it's not knowing what to do, but knowing my values. If you think in terms of values, you start thinking of different concepts. It's just reframing in the sense that you're focused on a different set of concepts and you can come up with new ideas from there. Yeah, and hopefully the, the, the reframe though because by being focused on a different set of concepts, you are saying that there is something else that is more relevant to this situation. And that yes. could be driven. Anyway, I don't want to get too abstract because I don't know, yeah. don't, don't know what I'm talking about. But well, yeah, the just think the more literal example first as what a reframe is, because even that can change the way you look and think about things and change your solutions. I'll give you another another example, which they gave in the book, which is, um, what was the name of the company? Uh, Disney was asking, how can we shorten the customer's times in the queue? And it was yeah. impossible to answer it. I don't know if you're, you already know about this, but probably it was, it was impossible to answer that question. Like they couldn't do it. And so they reframed it as how can we make people's experience more enjoyable when they're waiting? And then they, they developed all these uh, ideas of like, you know, putting on screens that show all these, fun little clips and like putting in timers and um getting giving people a certain amount of options to skip a certain amount of lines and just they did it that way and that worked as a solution but so in that case so that's a reframe is there some underlying premise that's being challenged when they're going from how do we shorten people's time to how do we apart from that specific question how do we shorten people's time versus how do we make people's time in the line uh, experience in the line more enjoyable? Is there some underlying premise that's being challenged there? Or is that just literally just asking a different question, uh, trying to find just a different problem to solve? Refocusing is how we describe that. 
not necessarily a principle okay. that's changed. Yeah. But I do think once you get to more complex questions, it does become a matter of changing the principle. Like you thinking about like what career you pursue or really broad theory of science. You're not just questioning a particular result, but an entire theory like evolution. Right. Like could evolution was like a complete reframe on biology as a field. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so on the topic of theft, which I, I can't, it's this is like one of the areas where I feel like I, I'm sensing contradictions in what I can see and prove and what I'm reading in objectivism. But so I've heard one example on, on the topic of pirating is like you undercut their value to you. <clears throat> so like if I pirate someone's stuff, it undercuts their value to me. And in the like, so in the abstract, I get that, but I, I just cannot see like in the concrete, it's so difficult to find evidence for it. Uh, at least I can't, it's so difficult to concretize. So when someone gives you an answer like that, does that may, maybe it's true, but you can't unless you can unless you can find all the concretes that make you can can see how that's true. It's and and project it. It's like that's not that's not an answer, right? Yeah, you want more evidence, and it's hard to just yeah they're asserting this, but it would help if there's more concrete examples. I can't really ever. I can't give you concrete examples of people who pirate in, then there's some moral system that, or that they lack morals entirely, or that there's some traumatic thing that happens in their life, I, or any just terrible, or that their life becomes a mess or something. It doesn't happen really. And it's very difficult to demonstrate why it would be wrong other than say, oh, you're just violating their principles uh, that they can use their intellectual property how they want. Yes. Yeah. The difficulty, yeah, yeah. the difficulty is probably more about the nature of IP for you than it is the theft per se, because IP is very, is a very difficult topic to argue about in some objectivists, like a small minority, but they exist that they deny that IP is a, a valid thing and so there is no theft of ip if it doesn't exist obviously and i agree with ip but Me that's too. a completely different argument to go about what's the effect of ip and what how does ip actually affect the world concretely not just that this abstract thing that you can't that there's intellectual stuff you can own but what does it is it really property in the same way as owning a house? Even for me, that was, even though I've always agreed with IP, it's, it's very difficult to conceptualize and concretize that, to then argue that stealing it is wrong. Because if I'm not clear on IP, I can't clearly articulate why stealing it is wrong. Right, right, okay. So I think it's more that. But maybe have trouble with on a on a basic level. I know not not for my own interest, but actually maybe for my own interest. Let's say I produce a course, like it, let's say we, we yeah. both we make a course and we sell it on uh, thinking methods or whatever. Yeah, and we we put it up and it's five hundred dollars, and then all these people pirate it. That's like why would we want to produce anything after that, right? Right. So that's, that's part of the reasoning. I can see that. Like I know enough to see yes. from my perspective, but then. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't, it, it, it's also hard because you can say, well, if you're one person and tons of people still buy it and they make money, it's very, it's, it's so hard to reason about it. But, um, you know, another thing I've heard is that, well, if you drop this, you've dropped the principle of property rights and therefore you don't have property rights. And I'm like, well, can you, can I make a case for following a certain principle where I can't like, it's almost like you can say it's good for me. If I break the principle, I can at least I can immediately concretely see that. I agree it's not self-evident, but it appears to be good for me. But um, 
I won't do it because I violate the principle. Like, is that even an argument? Shouldn't it be, shouldn't the case, even for every case of following a principle, not be that you'll violate another principle, but it will be, here's why it's terrible for you. Um, Because it seems weird to me to, it's like you're holding everything together. Like you're saying, yes, it might be good, but you'll violate the principle and everything will fall apart. And you're like, so you better, we want to keep this objectivist system together. So you need to follow this principle in order that you don't violate another principle, but there's no case for like why breaking this one is so terrible for you. I mean, if that were the case, to say this principle is nothing to do with it. It's just the one that you break that matters is nothing of like you didn't break this one, but property rights will go with, you know, it was the example was you, you, yeah. you no longer have, you can no longer, you no longer have a ground on which to defend property rights if you break them. But I'm like, but that's not, it doesn't seem like that's an argument from against, you know, someone who's saying, well, you can advocate it. And yes, you, of course, you're, um, what is it called? Uh, a hypo, you're like, a, um, I forgot the word for it, but you're like, you're, you're contradicting, you're, you're advocating it, but at the same time you're stealing. But it's the reason someone's saying that is because it appears that someone can get away with that and they actually benefit. And so to say, oh, you'll violate a principle so you can't do it. It doesn't seem to be an argument for me. I, it's not convincing anyway. I'm not sure I follow. Okay, I might need to read. If I, I'll find you, I might, as I'm reading through threads and stuff, if I find something that's relevant, an example of that, I'll, sure. I'll put it in the thing and it will be more more clear. I don't, I don't yeah. think I worded that well either. Yeah. Um, I read a related chapter in uh, How We Know, so it was about principles, like, can I violate it just this once? And so here's some quotes that I wanted to chat with you about. So a contradiction, if maintained, paralyzes thought. One can proceed only by abandoning logic and just making up an answer as an arbitrary dictum. Ultimately, the alternative is adherence to logic or cognitive paralysis. Can we, can we flesh, try and flesh this out a bit more? So like on the, on, in some sense, on some level I get this, but then I'm thinking like, okay, so I'm, I'm right now feeling very much con conflicted and a contradiction between what I can concretely make sense of like, okay, if someone steals some course, they, it does appear that they're benefiting versus what I conceptually in a very abstract way sort of see, okay, well, yeah, I, I violate all these other principles and these principles are supposed to help me. And if I violate once I've gone on, the principle of emotionalism so that in a sense there's a contradiction there right between these principles are supposed to be good for you in your life and not self-torture versus here is an instance where i just can't see how it applies and so that that's a contradiction but how does that how is that paralyzing thought well by his reasoning okay so you reach a contradiction yes you're there that contradiction so he's saying well, you can forget logic and the existence of the contradiction and just keep going anyway, which would be just be arbitrary or just assert things without using reason, just say it's so or something like that. I mean, you could just assert, well, it's true anyway. Um, so you could adhere to the logic, which, which would mean you try to resolve it that's fine uh, okay paralysis i don't i still don't get the paralysis part because you say you make up an answer well that's not paralysis you're doing something so the reasoning is incomplete here i don't see how he then demonstrates that you reach paralysis from abandoning logic he does say if maintained which i'm not sure what <sighs> yeah but i don't think he's reaching the it seems like there's something missing okay like there's a term missing in the argument like okay you've abandoned logic and now you're making arbitrary claims and it, then it leads to paralysis if you maintain that so how do you get from making arbitrary claims to paralysis like what's the middle term there right. that's what i don't know I, I get what you're saying though about, okay, so if, if I have a contradiction and if I want to act, at least if I want to act, not think, 
then I have to decide between either emotion or reason, right? Or at least using logic or not. At least in strictly those terms, you either right. use reason or you don't. Okay. So those are the only two options. There's no third right. option there. But it, but then the only in the only case where your thought is paralyzed is where you choose to for, forget the contradiction and just act with emotion, right? Well, it that, leads there eventually, but that's where I don't know what he's claiming. Like, how do you get from the making arbitrary claims to paralysis? There's got to be something in between that leads from one to the other. I, I don't fully follow that, but okay. Like, Wait. you're still thinking, at least you're still doing something. If you're making up arbitrary answers, right? If you're saying things, even if there's stupid reasons, you're you're still acting, you're still doing. Yeah. But paralysis mean you're not even able to think that far. You're just stuck, like literally, like paralyzed and unthinking. So, but if I don't if you're know not what if you're not thinking, you can still act, right? Based on emotion. I'm not sure if that's why I'm unsure about his claim exactly is okay. he just saying that what does he mean by paralysis does he mean the halting right. of thought entirely I'm or the halting ask. of successful thought or the halting of rational thought entirely because that would make sense if that's what he meant but i'm not sure what he means i'm gonna post at some point i've, I've started I mean, breaking down this problem of theft into like lots of little problems of about principles and stuff so that i'm going to put this up at some point and notice that he says cognitive paralysis there so it seems like he's trying to distinguish something and i'm not sure what the cognitive is modifying there oh i see what you're saying yes adherence to logic or the alternative is adherence to logical cognitive paralysis yeah okay so like rational thought i guess something like that it might be what he means yeah I'm that makes sure. sense that it would be anyway but let's uh let's see if we can fit more in oh so this is about um violating a principle i think again if you want to read it rather than me read it out loud yeah i'll read it Yeah. So, okay. I guess I have two questions. What, uh, more about the interpretation of this. So one is what, what does he mean by provides the map that identifies the location of a goal that you can't directly see? Like, I, I'm not sure what it means not to directly see a goal. And then two, uh, is this, is he saying that maybe there are instances where I cannot project concretely why doing, why not following a principle is bad for me, but it's still bad for me. And it's more like an inductive sort of leap. Although, yeah, I, I don't know if that makes sense actually. Cause well, as far as interpreting this, he's using the map metaphor already before he even says location of the goal. So principles are like a map. So now we're thinking about a map. So a map is identifying, maps normally identify goals that you can't directly see. That if you're looking for you a mean? treasure map, say if you have a treasure map yeah, and get to some island you've never been to, I mean, that's literally showing you, you've never, you can't see it from oh, where okay. you are, but right. this is where it is. Right. Follow the map and you'll get there. Then you'll eventually see it. And and you got to follow the map. You don't just say, oh, I'm following the map, but hey, maybe I'll go northwest or, or I'll ignore the map for a while. And just try it out. I mean, in one sense, that's violating the principle. You're not going to be able to get to your goal. I mean, that's what he's trying to say. That without that map, you're, you're not going to get there. Okay. Even if it might seem appealing to okay. try something else out. This right. is the way to do it. Right. We can only take the metaphor so, so the metaphor so far. Because you know that's the one where like, oh, I don't know the principle's correct. Yeah. On well, the same way as a map, like 
how do you know the map is correct? Well, it could be it to do with, well, that's just a the metaphor doesn't apply anymore. It's just to say that the principles are a map there. They tell you this is this is how you get to the goal and follow these steps and you'll get there. <laughs>